Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Marty Wuldorf, who is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University. His research focuses on advancing our understanding of the neural and psychological mechanisms underlying human attentional processes and their effects on other cognitive functions. Welcome, Marty. Hi there. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your older papers uh, from the 90s entitled Modulation of Early Sensory Processing in Human Auditory Cortex During Auditory Selective Attention. Uh, You said neuromagnetic fields were recorded from human subjects uh, as they listened selectively to sequences of rapidly presented tones in one ear while ignoring tones of a different pitch in the opposite ear. And so so you're giving them auditory stimuli and then you're measuring what's happening in their brain? That's right, that's right, yeah. So um, we we are trying to understand the neural mechanisms by which we, um, uh, and moral and cognitive mechanisms by which we accomplish um, mental functions such as selective attention. Uh, and so we measure brain activity while they're engaged in these tasks. This particular task um, was meant to simulate what's called the cocktail party effect, uh, where you can be in a cocktail party and there's uh, uh, different conversations going on, and you can tune selectively to one conversation and, and tune out the other one. Yeah. And uh, this is meant to simulate that by having the stimuli coming rapidly to the two ears, So to one ear is like one conversation and to the other is is the other conversation. And the the rapidly presented stimuli are simulating in a way that we can do in a lab to uh, the the two conversations to track what, how we are differentially processing an attended conversation versus an unattended stimulus input. The subjects are instructed to do that? Yes. Right from the beginning. Yes, on different runs, okay. they either attend to the stimuli coming into the, the left ear or the stimuli coming into the right ear. And then what we have then is we, when we're attending to the left ear, they're selectively uh, listening to that ear. That's the attended side. And the other side is unattended. And then we switch, we get the reverse. So we can compare the same physical stimuli, say stimuli of the left ear, the responses in the brain when you're attending to that input versus when you're attending elsewhere. Everything else is controlled, the stimuli are identical, the overall arousal is the same. What we want to see is the selective focusing of attention and what that does. And there were um, long standing arguments based on behavioral work as to how much attention affects stimulus processing. So there were early selection theories and late selection theories that went on for, for quite a long time, just based on you know, trying to understand it from based on button presses and, and other sorts of behavioral responses. 
where early uh, late selection theorists found, felt that all stimuli are processed to considerable sensory and perceptual detail. And then at some late stage of processing, what's relevant to you enters consciousness and you process it at a higher level. Early selection theorists held that there was a selective filtering mechanism that the higher levels of the brain could impose to modulate incoming information at much earlier levels. So these are, had to be based on with behavior on reaction time after at, at the end of a, of a 500, 600 milliseconds. But by measuring brain activity, yeah. We could Something, we, we could we yeah. could see when exactly in the in the processing attention would affect that. Did it affect it early in the first ten milliseconds when the brainstem activity, or when it first hit auditory cortex, or hundreds of milliseconds afterwards? And this study and the study that preceded it, EEG study, found that indeed you could affect stimulus processing very early uh, and before. Uh, the, 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 the stimulus processing had gone very far. And one could infer from that that there are descending pathways from higher levels of the brain that are making these decisions to kind of turn up the gain mm-hmm. on the stuff you're interested in at very early levels and turn it down on the things you're not, not interested in. Yeah, that, that's, that's really fascinating. So one thing I was wondering, Marty, though, in a cocktail party, um, you know, so... so there is, isn't there a difference uh, in, you know, sort of naturally doing it and in an experimental setting, you are asked to just uh, focus on your left or the right ear and ignore the other. Wouldn't there be some complications because, uh, you know, we don't behave like that in a cocktail party, right? That's true. That's true. And we, 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 we do have this as a general issue is that we have a phenomena in the real world that we're trying to do a selective study of. Uh, with and to yeah. try to figure out mechanism, and so we have to constrain it down. Um, one of the advances of these studies where the stimuli came very rapidly, and they were very you, you had to attend to one ear to pick out the slightly fainter or distinct uh, or an occasional uh, deviant tone in that ear. So they were fast and uh, 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 and more difficult to do the task. And so you really couldn't do attend to both ears at once. That do the task, just like in a cocktail party, if somebody is yeah. talking on your to the left side and somebody else is talking to the right side, they're talking fairly rapidly. You can't attend to both conversations at the same time. That's been known for a long time behaviorally. There, there's a bottleneck somewhere, and there's a selective filtering. So where, where, where does that filtering happen, and how does it happen? And uh, so that's that's what we were able to get at with with the, this this, this uh, neural neural mechanism. But you're right; it's not quite like that. It's meant to simulate it in the best way we could to be able to track the attentional focus. And we were able to see that the differential processing affected um, uh, the, the, the the stimulus process was processed differently when it was attentive versus unattended, starting at 20 milliseconds after it hit the ear. And that, as we know, is bef- just so about the time it's first hitting primary auditory cortex. And that's a point in time where one would be very hard to maintain that s- sensory and perceptual processing was complete by then. So it must have been the fact that you set up a preset biasing of the gain, kind of like, mm. like you have a world out there and you have uh, the input of different st- radio stations. Like there's your podcast you listen yeah. to, and you're listening to Rachel Maddow over here, and the ball games over here, and you want to listen to one or the other, right. you can turn the radio yeah. uh, dial, the volume dial, up or down, and you can turn it up on the one you're interested in, say Rachel Maddow, <laughs> and you want to turn the the other ones down somewhat, um, and, and so that then everything that's coming in is bigger, more more strongly processed at very early levels. Um, in the one you're interested in, and it's turned down in the other. Now, you don't turn it off in the others because it could be a tiger. Right. Uh, or it, you get some information in there. We know yeah. that from other other sorts of studies. So you don't turn it off, but you just give it an extra boost. It gives, it gives you, you give more processing at very early levels to the input that you're interested in. 
so so the conclusion or the hypothesis out of this one body is that the 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 system uh, at a higher level uh, is making certain decisions uh, in sort of predetermined fashion and uh, i'm just making the statement you can correct me if, if this is this is not the right understanding and and sort of all the uh, all the things that we do let's say in a cocktail party follows that uh, and so once a decision is made you know the system is sort of set up uh to tune into one thing and tune that's out right and we we might we might make, choose that based on some other information like you might sample and go okay uh this is this is MSNBC and this is the ball game and this is this is Gil Eppen and when this these these and, and some other conversations they go oh okay well I want to listen to this one and so you have some input first and then you make that decision and you you do this uh this selective um uh modulation of the input to that one's coming in bigger you've turned the volume up if you will on that one and turn the volume down on some of the other ones uh and you do that based on what you find most interesting or important at any particular time and that you can make as an upper level decision now in some of the studies that we we may talk about today sometimes there's an interrupt that pulls your attention yeah. over and uh, like a loud sound or right. a sudden movement in vision or you know that would you know you're attending here and suddenly something happens over here that pulls your attention over like that saber tooth tiger or a loud loud sound or some other thing that pulls your attention over or something that's very meaningful can pull it over we might talk about that today as well too of the interaction of attention and reward or value uh let's let's go into that marty so you want one other paper from 2000 uh inhibitory control in children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD even related potentials identify the processing component and timing of an impaired right frontal response inhibition yes. mechanism the or deficit in inhibitory control may account for a wide range of dysfunctional behaviors in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder ADHD um and so so this is sort of what what you're talking about right so you can trace this back to where the processing is being done and how selective is that processing is that the way to understand it yes yeah, so um in the in the in the case that i was describing a moment ago there is in a there we we're watching the effects of processing on a sensory component but we're inferring that there's a control mechanism a control process uh, mm-hmm. uh that is say turning down the radio over here and or contrast over here and turning it up over here and some of the later papers mm-hmm. we look directly at that control process in this case uh it was a, a clinically relevant um question uh, involving inhibitory control that in 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 in, in an or or, or a control process in this case the ability to control a motor movement that you're about to make uh this was uh called a stop signal task very wide, widely used under other sorts of control uh mechanism studies uh where yeah. uh you have a stimulus that comes in and it comes in as a visual it's a visual auditory could be auditory and it says okay Uh, respond uh and most of the time you do that that's a go stimulus but 3 quarters of the time at a certain amount of time after the go stimulus you get another stimulus i mean 3 uh, quarters of the time it's a go stimulus 1 quarter of the time let's say a certain amount of time after the go stimulus you get another stimulus that says stop so you're about to mm-hmm. press a button to do a detection or discrimination but then you have to stop that's inhibitory control kids with yeah. ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADD as well sometimes it's called called as well uh are worse at this they they aren't as if that they can't stop as well they can't if that um um uh, if they if the if the stop stimulus is even further in time after the go they they still can't stop as well so why is that what happens when you get the stop st- stimulus um and what we yeah. we saw in this study 
Uh, let, let me backpedal a second. So one of the approaches, let me take a broader view for here. What we're trying to study is the whole system. And there's a system of control processes, probably in the frontal and parietal lobes generally, maybe with in, in, in conjunction with some uh, um, brainstem um, nuclei, but that these do control processes, move your attention around, shift when you're when something happens suddenly somewhere, control your motor response, you're, you're, able to, you're able to control your behavior. And then there's the effects of these systems, these control mechanisms on other parts of the brain, such as sensory processing. So the other example I, I told you, the auditory selective attention, we were watching the effects of selective attention on the sensory processing and inferring activations of, that were at the control process. Now, in this case, what we wanted to compare was what happens when you get that stop signal in a, in a, in a control uh, um, uh, normally developing kid and an ADHD kid. And, and uh, what we found is that in response to the, and this was a paper by uh, Steve Plitzka is a biological, is a psychiatrist at, at the University of Texas the Health Science Center in, in, in San Antonio, and he was the, the lead on this um, and with Mario Leaki yeah. and I. And the, the, what we found is that if we looked at the event-related response, meaning the brain activity triggered by the stop signal, in normal kids, we saw this big um, negative polarity brain wave over right frontal cortex. In other words, over a control region. And uh, uh, yeah. under the view that most frontal and parietal activity is more control related. And it was, it was big on, mm -hmm. on the right, over right, uh, in, in, in right frontal. And 80, uh, kids with ADHD did not have much of this wave. Uh, and if they had a little bit, it varied as um, in, um, um, correlated with the, the degree of their symptoms. So they had more severe symptoms. They had very small uh, response of this right frontal response, and they had more mild symptoms. They had a bigger one. So it seems like this in normal uh, people uh, in developing individuals, uh, the right when you when you have to suddenly do something to stop yourself from and do some control over your behavior over your you're about to press a button and you have to stop yourself you um, elicit this right frontal activity um, that helps you do that and the the ADHD kids don't do so to don't uh, elicit as much of this uh, this correlated then this corresponded to other some studies in we using what's called functional MRI that uh, found also that there was some deficit in the right frontal regions. Uh, one of the differences though, between say fr functional MRI and these EEG studies that we're talking about, this was a wave at 200 milliseconds. With EEG, we get very high temporal resolution, but coarse spatial resolution for the processing of, of, of stimuli. With fMRI, and before that, PET scans, but fMRI more recently, in the last 20 years, you get very good localization of activity, but not good temporal resolution. It takes seconds for you to pick that up. So they, these were two different sets of studies that were corresponding in some way that we linked between, and they, they, they were converging evidence. But here we could see when exactly it was happening and, and, and coarsely where. So, so Marty, if I understand this, so more simplistically, um, is it is it correct in saying that um, the the amount of information coming in is the same uh, for somebody suffering from ADHD and a normal developing person, uh, but in the former case, there is some sort of deficiency in the control mechanism. So presumably a normal behavior requires some mediation from yes. the control circuit, which seems to be absent or, in or, the ADHD. Or, or, or in pair, person. let's say in pair. Yes, in I'd pair. say that's because their okay. sensory responses under just normal conditions aren't don't seem to differ very much. The, the sensory responses yeah. in, say, visual cortex, auditory cortex, uh, the sensory input, um, you know, to those sensory uh, 
specific cortices. It's more, it seems to be more in the control mechanisms. In particular, some something in the right frontal lobe is uh, is somewhat impaired or deficient um, in, 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 in patients with ADHD. So is there, um, I, know, I know that this was from 2000, so a lot of things have happened since then. Um, clearly there has to be some therapeutic um, intervention direction here, right? I mean, if we really identify uh, locationally and we really identify the mechanism, could, couldn't we influence that electromagnetically? Elect you mean, could we have an in electromagnetic intervention? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's see. I would say there's a couple different ways to do an intervention. I mean, what we're looking at here are what would we call, you know, we're recording, you know, recording brain activity in, in people and, and patients who are engaged in cognitive acts. Um, you can also have a perturbation of some sort uh, 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 where you can perturb the system and see what happens. Like, um, and you can perturb it with a a disorder like ADHD or deficiency, or you can perturb it with drugs, medications, or psychoactive drugs. I mean, uh, and how does the brain differ uh, cognitively and neurally when you do that? In the case of ADHD, I haven't followed that as much as, as closely. I mean, um, uh, this, as I say, was collaboration with some um, psychiatrists uh, in, in Texas. Um, we did do a follow-up or two when I went was at Duke, but... Um, uh, um, it, it was the case that they were studying in these ADHD kids, they were off their medication uh, while, while we were doing the study for that period of time because we wanted to see what would happen when they were just normally not medicated. And uh, w w there, was, there were studies looking at um, what happens to these brain waves and to the fMRI activity we see in frontal cortex, it's different, right frontal cortex, um, when uh, um, uh, the, 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 the kids were on their medication versus not. And it did seem to normalize their brain activity um, uh, when they were on, more on medication. Uh, but I haven't followed that so closely uh, specifically for ADHD. That said, you bring up a, a broader point about interventions here, and there are, you know, medication interventions. You also brought up a lot electromagnetic interventions, and there's a lot of work in recent years using a couple techniques. One is transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, uh, which is very strong magnetic fields that produce electric fields in the brain, and you can actually go through the skull, through through the scalp, through the skull, and and and, and um, interacts with uh, the neural tissue. And people have been using that. You can certainly do that in some specific locations with very specific effects. Like if you stimulate motor cortex that way, you can get a motor response. If you stimulate visual cortex, you get kind of a um, kind of a uh, visual stimulation you, you, you seem to see, uh, you perceive. Uh, to do it uh, uh, more specifically uh, for higher cognitive function has been a little bit more slippery, but it's a very, very active area of research where, I mean, I have some collaborations looking at those, both what happens cognitively when you stimulate and also what do we see different neurally. Like, for instance, can you uh, influence uh, um, uh, memory uh, or working memory abilities in aging patients, such as those with mild cognitive impairment or, or pre kind of pre-Alzheimer's. Um, so you can do these sorts of, of stimulations. That's been um, a little bit more slippery because it's hard to hit a specific brain spot um, but you probably can do it indirectly by hitting a spot that hits another spot that is particularly important. Um, <laughs> like sort of a relay. Uh, so, so I want to touch on this, uh, Marty. So your other paper, uh, the neural basis of momentary lapses of yes. lapses in attention. So a related, related issue, but in a, in a different area. So mo you say momentary lapses in attention 
frequently impair goal-directed behavior, sometimes with serious consequences. Nevertheless, the lack and integrated view of the brain mechanisms underlying such lapse. So we, we don't quite understand why that's happening. Uh, but is it true that uh, when we pick this up, these mom momentary lapses in attention, that is sort of precursive to later issues like Alzheimer's, or that is not the thing? Later issues, there? you mean like for Alzheimer's? Uh, improved, yeah, progress oh, into Alzheimer's, you know. Um, yeah. Well, the particular study you're talking about, uh, which was... Um, uh, spearheaded by a postdoc in my lab at the time, Daniel Weissman, who's now at University of Michigan faculty. Um, and uh, you were talking about the 2006 paper, I guess, in Nature Neuroscience. That paper yeah. Um, yeah. was not really a clinically oriented paper. Uh, much of my work has been directed toward basic cognitive functions, um, though some of them, like the ADHD paper, was taking it to a clinical realm, and we've done some more of that more recently, and most of them can have their role or ramifications yeah. or implications for cognitive, uh, for, 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 for clinical questions. That one was more just about everyday life. We, we always, we, we tend to focus on things. Yeah. Uh, we try to for an extended period of time, but our our, memory, our attention waxes and wanes. And, and so, yeah. you know, it can be very focused and then it, we can't, you know, then it um, diminishes some and it comes back. We were trying to track that from a system's point of view by measuring, in that case, that was a functional yeah. MRI paper. And this gets at this question I said before about the system. What we found there is that the frontal the frontal and parietal regions are doing the control and are con controlling what uh, this is the way the, uh, lots of people tend to think about it these days, though it's, it's a very interactive dynamic system, but that they control the sensory input and they might control some uh, modulatory activity uh, or descending signals to other like memory regions or, or whatever. But in this case, if, we found that when um, we, by doing a, a trial to trial linking of a reaction time on each trial to the brain activity, yeah. we found that when somebody was going to be slower on a particular trial, which probably suggests mm -hmm. that they're not attending as much, then the frontal responses, frontal cortex responses were lower right before that trial. So there's a series of trials. They were doing a task. The specific task wasn't quite critical, happened to be a particular task. But so right before you were, um, you, you, a, a, a trial that you were going to be slower on, your frontal activity decreased. And that was just kind of a, that, that's your waning of attention. It just kind of went down. You weren't as focused. And then in, in conjunction with that, the sensory response to the stimulus that came through on that trial was also lower. So the, and, and then you were slower. So there's a whole cascade of processes that happen across the brain. There's a control that is trying to hold, hold up this attentional focus. It goes down. Then you don't get as big a sensory response to the stimulus that's coming in. And then you're not as fast to respond. That would, but that's within subject. Okay. Uh, from subject to, you know, from yeah. trial to trial. Sometimes you're faster, sometimes you're slower. And this is co-varying with the level of activity in the different brain regions that uh, yeah. uh, uh, appears to be underlying that eventual behavioral output. How does that apply yeah. to a clinical? Do you have control, have control over that, Marty? Uh, or could we, could we say anything about it? Does the subject have control over it or is it? Is it, is it, you know, sort of uh, happening autonomously? That's a good question. Um, in general, what we were tracking was just how it happened naturally. And we were using as our link by just saying, okay, ones they were slower on versus ones they were faster on. And we just co-varied that. Yeah. Um, uh, I would I would say, you know, I I think that we've done some other later studies where we found that, you know, you know some something like coffee uh, has... Uh, uh, you know, which is the most widely used psychoactive drug in the world, probably. Um, 
you know, you, you, you do t tend to have uh, better attentional focus. And we can see some of these. Now, this was an fMRI study, but we can see correlations of those with greater temporal resolution by using EEG, electrical recordings, or MEG. And so, and, and similarly, they, 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 they can go up and down um, by using coffee. But I guess if you really, really try to focus more, we do know that, and this gets into some of the later papers about uh, motivation, that if you are going right. to get rewarded on that trial, you have more attentional, pre, pre, preparatory attentional activity before the trial starts. It increases it. So you probably recruit the, the reward possibility leads you to recruit those uh, attentional circuits that uh, are um, uh, helping you enhance processing on an ongoing way. Yeah. So we are back, uh, Marty. We were talking about uh, stimulus stimuli coming into the into the brain, auditory and and other stimuli, and how the brain processes it. And uh, in certain situations, certain systems, uh, certain control mechanisms, for example, uh, if it is impaired, uh, it could result in uh, disease states such as ADHD. Um, we, al we also talked about how, how the brain might be able to tune out uh, of a large number of uh, auditory stimuli coming in, such as such a cocktail party, and really tuning into one conversation and that is sort of a systemic effect uh, in terms of doing that. Um, so I want to go into uh, some of your uh, more recent papers. Before we do that, Marty, one thing I wanted to touch on is um, ADHD and this attention, uh, you know, uh, going up and, uh, and down a phenomenon they might have had some evolutionary advantages, I would imagine, right? It, it would have resulted in uh, maybe not being, uh, not being eaten by a wild animal if you were able to, you know, sort of look at a lot of different things at the same time. Is that, is that possible? Yeah, sure. I think that uh, we don't completely understand some of the evolutionary aspects. Certainly, various of these systems that we're talking about, the con you know, con con the frontal and parietal regions control uh, other regions um, have been studied in animals, uh, uh, other uh, um, non-human primates, monkeys and um, uh, macaque uh, in particular, but also in other animals, you know, cats and other mammals. And they have similar systems, especially monkeys, um, where you can actually go in and you can record. I mean, in humans, we typically need to record on the scalp non-invasively with measures such as electrical recordings, EEG or MEMEG, magnetoencephalograph, or functional MRI, things that we come in from the outside, but and occasionally we get inside the head uh, when for some patients who are being uh, evaluated for epileptic seizures, but typically a lot of the stuff we, we get inside. So evolutionarily, we know that some of these same systems were, were in place uh, in uh, our um, uh, evolutionary ancestors and uh, where we can actually get even single unit recordings, single neuron recordings uh, uh, and get more detailed about the, the local circuitry that's involved in say the frontal cortex or in the this visual auditory sensory cortex, what's happening, the modulations that go on. But we, the, those things uh, do evolve. Now, why do we do, why do we have those um, uh, is a, a broader question yeah. Uh, yeah. In, 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 in many ways. One, you know, why is it that we can't listen to two different conversations at once? Uh, and there seems to be a bottleneck somewhere in the brain where in order to have, we, we need to focus on certain input in order to um, uh, analyze it and process it um, fully enough to do what we need to do. Yeah. And we can't do that so fully. I mean, people know, you know, if you're, you're talking, you're, you're listening to one conversation, 
and or you're reading and somebody else is trying to talk to you, you can't really process them both at the same time. And so there's a bottleneck somewhere. And part of what this attentional research is about is trying to understand how that bottleneck works. At what level does it work? You know, uh, for example, that early versus late selection question that uh, we talked about at the very beginning. Um, why that is, is not completely clear. It is the case that we can process things, some things, um, in parallel. Um, we can, uh, but so there's a bottleneck for higher level processing, such as semantics. Right. Um, and that uh, that shows up in a lot of different different things, I would imagine. I want to touch on one other paper, um, Marty, uh, which is we, we talked about the auditory stimuli, and this is about the visual spatial attention. Yeah. Again, you're looking at this here fMRI uh, data uh, to sort of look at uh, where the activity is uh, from a visual perspective, right? When, when those types of stimuli get in. Yes, uh, that was attending to different. Well, the 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 the, the, the Weissman et al. paper um, was a visual task. You were doing a visual task, and we were looking at the dropping of visual of frontal cortex activity when you were going to be slow. A parallel paper that, or a converging paper than that, it was one I think you're referring to is one where we used both EEG and fMRI. Yeah. Where, because as I say, the EEG gives high temporal resolution, but coarse spatial, coarse or sometimes ambiguous spatial. fMRI gives great spatial, but very low temporal. And so we did them both and tried to link them because ultimately what we want to do is be able to understand when you have a cognitive function, what parts of the brain are activated and in what sequence and timing. And neither of these methods by themselves give give all that. We don't really have a method that we can do that for the whole brain at this point. If you go inside an animal brain, you know exactly where you are and when, but you can you typically get you only get to where you're recording from. And of course they're recording from multiple areas now, but to get the whole brain in a human, we can't really get um, full evaluation of timing and and location at the same time with the same method. So in this particular case, we had a cued attention experiment. Um, and in, instead of being this uh, sequence of tones in the left and right ear, like a two conversations, it was a cueing experiment where you get a cue that says, attend to the left or attend to the right part of space for the upcoming um, trial. And so you get a cue, uh, and then a, a, a target would come afterwards, either to the to the left or the right, typically to the side you're attending to, and you have to do something with that. Well, the advantage of this cueing paradigm, which evolved from some early behavior experiments a while ago by uh, Mike Posner and colleagues around 1980, now we were doing these with recording brain activity. And my, my lab and other labs have done a number of studies in this. And the advantage of this sort of approach is when you get the cue that tells you to attend to the left or attend to the right or don't attend, that's when you actually start your your control process. Mm. And then you have a certain amount of time, you move your attention over, and then you have a target. So it separates out the process by which you actually invoke your control from what that control does to an upcoming stimulus. That's, so this is this Q target paradigm. So we did that focusing uh, largely it, to try to see what does the Q do? What's the, what's the, what is acti activating in the, um, to do the control process? And when you do these sorts of experiments, we and others found that, that there were certain regions in frontal and parietal cortex mm. that would activate when yeah. you got the Q. Uh, and then, uh, and then what we were, trying to see by using both the EEG with the timing and the fMRI with the location was when this happened and which started first and then what happened later when you got the target or even before the target. And what we found, this was a paper the, uh, uh, in, in PLOS Biology, um, Tineke Grantejean was the first author uh, in, I think, 2007, where you get activity first 
in the frontal regions, areas that the animal researchers would call frontal eye fields, but they also control attention. That activates first when you have to shift your attention. Then you get some parietal, medial parietal regions that activate a yeah. couple hundred milliseconds after that. And again, this is using both EEG and fMRI to get the timing and the location. Yeah. And then after that, we got differential activity on the left side or the right side, depending on whether they were supposed to attend to the left or attend to the right. But differential before the target even came. Hmm. So what we're looking at was the biasing activity in the sensory cortex, preparing that part of the of the sensory of the, that that sensory cortex for the upcoming target stimulus, so it could be processed better or faster. So there was a cascade of, of uh, so you first get this Q that, well, first you have to evaluate the Q means, but we subtract that out with a sensory control because we're not really interested in the sensory processing of the Q. But then we get this frontal cortex activating some frontal, some control, and then a couple, about 400 milliseconds after the Q, the Q is like an L or an R for a 10 left or a 10 right or right. left hour, right hour, you get that. And then a couple hundred milliseconds later, you get activity in medial frontal, medial parietal, I mean. So first frontal, medial frontal, then um, not midline frontal, but more medial frontal, then medial parietal. And then you get biasing in the sensory cortex, depending on which side. Then when the target comes through, it's enhanced. So there's this whole cascade that we can map out by using these multiple methods. And we're trying to get both timing and the brain locations. Yeah, so so when when you look at this biasing um, uh, yeah. of the as you say, is it is it uh, trying to guess what stimulus is likely to be left or right in any way? Um, well, I guess the guessing. I mean, in this case, usually the if we told them to attend to the left, so also yeah. the brain is arranged contralaterally, meaning it's on the other side, meaning. When you get a stimulus on the left, it's processed in right visual cortex, yeah. and then and then right visual cort visual field goes to left visual cortex. So when you were told, okay, tend to the left, oh, um, usually the target would come on yeah. on the left, and then so it wasn't guessing yeah. as much as we basically we knew. So right. what was that biasing doing? And if you go into the neural circuitry, it seems like it increases. Uh, there's a different theories and, and studies about this, but it, 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 it seems to uh, increase the sensory um, sense, the sensitivity yeah. of that part of the brain to be able to process the upcoming stimulus and or it increces the signal to pro, pro, the, the signal to noise ratio yeah. of, the, of the processing stimulus when it came through. So, so it knew where it's going to be. It's basically, like you say, it's preparing that region, essentially focusing resources, I would imagine, to that region. Yes. In anticipation yes, of... Focusing resources. In fact, one of the definitions of attention is the directing, selective attention is directing processing resources selectively yes. to doing a particular thing. And they right. a particular region of space, a particular sound stream, a particular color, uh, on the screen or something like that. So, so that's what it's doing. It's and it's preparing those brain regions to do better processing, and it comes through. Now, if the stimulus comes to the other side, and you've already enhanced the wrong side, that would be a good experiment. Yeah. Oh no, that and that's called the invalidly cued. And yeah. what happens is you have to then suddenly switch your attention over, and yeah. you're slower at responding. That was the classic original Posner queuing paradigm where you had validly queued three quarters of the time it was validly queued and one quarter of invalidly queued and you get this difference in response time right. and accuracy right. and people inferred from the behavioral so what was trying to what they try to infer from a cognitive architecture standpoint what was happening in the brain what we're now doing in these past just couple of decades few decades is trying to actually measure the brain activity yeah. to see how exactly it is accomplishing that it is doing yeah. that i also wondered marty i i don't know if this was done suppose the the queue is completely random it would be interesting to see if both areas are equally prepared or it it, it has some sort of preferential bias 
Uh, so that's yeah. what I was going with guess, uh, guesses. And then, yeah, so, 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 evil and, you know, those types of questions too, right? Right. So they do these with different probabilities. So <laughs> if you uh, have it three quarters of likely uh, it's going to occur on the queued side versus one quarter, then you get some level of, of a queuing effect behaviorally and, and neurally. Uh, if you if it's ninety ten, it's a bigger one. If it's sixty forty, it's a smaller one because you don't want to devote all your attention over there because it's a good possibility to be on the other side. So there's that. Now that's if you do fifty fifty, yeah, like you get a letter that says uh, it's like instead of a left arrow, a right arrow, you get an arrow points both ways. So you have no information. Then you don't see anything differential. Hmm. But that's for what's called endogenous queuing where you're you're deciding oh okay i think it's going to be on this side i want to do i'm going to i'm trying to do good at this task and so i'm going to attend to that side another type of queuing is to have a sudden stimulus occur in the left field or the right field hmm. uh like a, a, a little bright flash of light in the left field, right field that automatically pulls your attention to that side right and in that case even if it's not predictive as to which side uh, that the, the target's going to come on, your attention is shifted to that side. So there's an automaticity to sudden, uh, and it's called exogenous queuing. Where yeah. you, we, and, and so, because that's something that could be relevant in real life. It could be that saber-toothed tiger, or it could be, um, it could be uh, a, a, sudden, a sudden movement in the woods. Yeah. It could be a sudden sound. And you want your attention to be able to shift toward that. And you don't want it. So even when you're really tuned into your reading or whatever else you're doing or some task, you, you don't want to turn off completely the input from other channels. And we know neurally that you do not. It's just it takes more uh, to to trigger that attentional pull. Right. Yeah. So I want to go into a couple of your more recent papers um, Marty, I think you touched on this before. So one of them is from 2018, uh, looking at the, the stimulus reward associations, the learning of stimulus reward associations in the brain. So you say successful adaptive behavior requires the learning of associations between stimulus specific choices and rewarding outcomes. Most research on the mechanisms underlying such processes has focused on subcortical reward processing regions in conjunction with frontal circuits. Um, and you're doing something slightly different here to, to look at this, uh, how the brain learns this. Yeah, so this was, yeah, this was um, uh, uh, the paper by uh, Barry Vandenberger, a grad, former graduate student of mine who's now in the net, back in the Netherlands um, uh, in social cognitive effective neuroscience. And what this uh, was... This has a mixture of reward and uh, attention uh, and learning. And just to give a backdrop to it, people have generally, and for many years, people studied attention separately from reward processing. Yeah. And uh, where, um, uh, you know, both of them tend to, enhance your processing if, 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 like, for instance, if you're going to be rewarded on a certain type of stimulus, you're faster or better processing that stimulus. And attention, if you're attending to something, you're, you respond better as well. We know the, those sorts of things, and we see some of the neural mechanisms. But, but they both, they seem to, they, there's many ways in which they interact. Um, and this is so a series of studies that we've done more recently, and a num number of people are studying this these days, in, in how does reward, um, first of all, how does it modulate attention, and or how does it interact with attention? And um, if we have repeated a reward to associated with a certain stimulus type, how do we learn that that stimulus is likely to be rewarded? So yeah. this has a mixture of those. So the task in this case was to, um, it was like a, a gambling task where um, you uh, had to uh, bet between two different stimulus types. One was on the left, one was on the right, and they were two object types. One were pictures of faces, one was pictures of houses. 
And we use those for specific regions, be, reasons because those evoke specific activations in sensory cortex that we could track. Yes. So on, on a 20 trial set, either houses or faces were more likely to be rewarded. But you didn't know ahead of time. You had to learn that during the 20 trial set. So at first, so it could be, you know, usually it was around 60, 65, 70% more likely, usually 65% more likely that one would lead, you would win and one and you would, uh, uh, 35% you, uh, you, you would lose. Yeah. And so you had to learn that. So when you first start off, you don't know. So it's 50, 50, you just guess houses, the house one or the face one, every stimulus is a pair. One face on one side, house on the other side. So you get those. And as we learn those, um, um, there's been a lot of studies with reward processing that have focused, as I said, as you just read from the abstract, yeah. on certain brain regions in, in subcortical brain regions, meaning not cortex. So right. nucleus accumbens, ventral striatum, those sorts of things, and maybe with a loop with frontal cortex. But to tell the difference between the face and our house, we could track, well, what about sensory, sensory regions? Are they involved in this reward processing? And then how does it interact with attention? Yeah. And what we found is uh, that, that when people learned over the course, so people would learn over 20 trial sets, they bet more and more often it, on, the, on the winner. Like, so if the face was 65% more likely to win on a certain 20 trial set, as you went through trial seven, eight, nine, you, you got better and better at, at choosing the one that's more likely to win. So you won more often. Yeah. Um, and what we wanted to do was say, okay, what if we can record from that, there's a certain brain region that's specific for faces that we can pick up both with ERPs, event-related potentials, EEG, or functional okay. MRI, though there's an EEG study. And we wanted to see, look at the activity in that region to see, well, if you just won on a face versus lost on a face, do you see any differential activity in sensory cortex? In other words, right. is some of the reward learning being stored, updated in the sensory cortex? And that's what we found. We hmm. found that uh, if you, if you, as you learned that faces were better than houses for a particular 20 trial set, you would get more activity in the face area after winning versus after losing, after choosing a face. And you didn't see that if you won or lost versus a house. And yeah. so uh, that, that this was then a role for the sensory cortex to, to learn and update the associations between reward and a specific sensory stimulus. In addition, then when that, the, after you learn that, as you learn that in the latter part of the 20 trial set, we could look at the attentional shifting process. So if you, then you're learning faces are better and then you get a face in a house, we could track with another brain wave to show that as you found out faces are better on that particular 20 trial set, your attention was immediately more drawn to the face than it was to the house. So that shows the interaction of the learning of the of the reward association and its ramification for the allocation of attention for upcoming stimuli and also for behavioral choices and decision making. So, so one thing uh, going back to the twenty eighteen paper that we were discussing, one thing I was thinking that there are some analogous things here uh, to computer science, uh, deep neural networks. Um, you know, we have supervised machine learning where you have labeled data. So you can, you know, basically teaching a machine uh, to identify a face or face up uh, by showing, you know, a large number of labeled cases around it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The thing, you know, basically it's sort of a similar type of thing in the brain, right? Uh, from an activity perspective. Yes, so people are using machine learning uh, algorithms to um, to look at brain data, yeah, uh, to to see how uh, you can uh, what whether brain activity can predict what a, a decision somebody will make, 
or what they're learning. A lot of these have been applied, in my view, applied to just like all the brain data, uh, mm -hmm. like all, all everything the brain is doing, like all the EEG channels across the whole scalp or with functional MRI throughout the brain. Um, and I, I think that they can be predictive uh, and then you can maybe use some of that to understand certain facets of cognition, but it's not very specific from a neural standpoint. I think some of the other more recent studies where they've used those approaches to look at brain data and, and, and then selectively find, okay, which brain regions are really encoding stuff? What's the yes. most important brain regions for encoding stuff? The most important time period uh, that it, for encoding stuff. And people are doing that more and more in the last few years. And I think that's going to get uh, provide more insight um, uh, rather than just what the whole brain is doing at, at once, because then I think we lose mm, the insight we gain from selectivity of that temporal cascade or for specific brain regions. Um, yeah. This, the, this, we did not use uh, that in this this study. We've been using doing some machine um, learning algorithms. We're starting to apply, uh, but again, in trying to do it in this more selective sense, this is more. We had a hypothesis. The hypothesis was that as you learned whether faces or houses were better, um, or was specific visual stimuli were better that the visual cortex, which has the, 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 the resolution to distinguish between faces and houses, that that's somehow right. how it needs to be pulled in. And, and, and the question is, does it just do it and send the information off? Or is there some sort of updating of a storage of those reward associations in the sensory specific regions that work in conjunction with say more non-specific reward processing regions, such as in uh, the subcortical regions or some parts of frontal cortex, do they work together? And uh, this is this key role, we think, where some of the updating and reward associations are being stored and updated in those sensory specific regions. So yeah. we have a specific hypothesis that we used brain activity patterns to address. Neuroscientists get very mad uh, when when uh, when folks like me uh, make uh, make connections between the brain and the computer. Uh, you know, there is yeah. two two um, lines of thought here. One is the brain is so complex, we can't really have any similarity between how the brain works and how the computer works. I'm sort of in that camp. Um, uh, but but are you optimistic uh, about um, us, you know, really using computational techniques to understand the brain better? Ah, well, you've asked really two questions yeah. there. One is, am I optimistic? <laughs> and the other is the relationship. You brought up this question about computers versus um, yeah. brains. And there's a lot of work, things being done in the computer world that are neurally yeah. inspired, neural yeah. networks, for example, example yeah. uh, which have uh, been around for a while. That's a different sort of question. How can we use neural activation, neural engineering, neural, how the, 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 the brain is engineered to help make better computers, like with pattern recognition, uh, that, that, or other sorts of approaches or decision-making or those, you know, playing chess, whatever yeah. it might be. Um, that's different than understanding how the brain works. Hmm. So compute, when I say, when I'm talking about computational approaches, that's not, I, I'm, I'm distinguishing yeah. that yeah. from the computational approaches of how the brain is, is com, um, computing right. things not how we can use the, how the brain does it to make better yeah, yeah. computers. That's a different question, important or useful <laughs> question for artificial right. intelligence. But, you know, and that, but, but I think what I was talking about, and I think what's always mostly driven me is how do our brains work? And I think that we, 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 we have systems, we have different systems that we can look at and we can uh, tease apart, but we also need to put them together into an interacting 
dynamic system that we will probably need better computational approaches for, but to understand our brains yeah. and how these do these things. And so those are, now, am I, am I optimistic? <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm optimistic that our, our ability to measure brain activity will will evolve and be better and better over the next 10 or 20 years. And that will be um, uh, game changing for certain questions we want to ask where we're still not completely sure if we know when and where things right, happen. Right. In the yeah, so it's- um, I think that's going to happen in terms of the computational stuff. I'm not so sure. That's not, um, I, I mean, I'm fairly um, technical in the things that I do, but not, uh, I, I, the computational theories are their, their, their own thing. But I think that if the computational approaches stay linked in well to, 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 to neuroscience, in other words, they don't detach and just get into their own their, their their own separate world that doesn't link into what we can measure in the brain, what we can prove and disprove in the brain, how we can evaluate the value of this computational theory or that computational theory. Um, but I think that's going to take a while because the brain is very complicated. So I think it's going to be in stages. We'll have a different levels of computational understanding. And uh, I think that we bootstrap from there. Uh, brains are very complicated. There's billions, billions of neurons. And um, how do we selectively, ha- what, what level of detail, and this is another important question, what level of detail is answering the questions we want to ask? I mean, there are questions where you want to look at local circuitry because you want to understand the input-output relationships of this particular part of the parietal lobe. Or, um, uh, and then there's times where you, you just want to understand how the brain works behaviorally, and you can look at that just behavioral. What is the right level for questions you want to ask? And um, systems cognitive neuroscience, for me, was always the level I was most interested in. Okay. Because it's about the whole brain, but we're still looking under the hood to see what is underlying, neurally underlying these cognitive processes and eventual behavior. Excellent, Excellent um, Marty. This has been great. Uh, thanks so much for spending time with me. Yeah, Love sure. This research. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.